Crosstalking WikiLeaks' latest release. I'm joined by my guest, Larry Johnson in Washington. He's a managing partner for Berg Associates and a former CIA analyst and a U.S. State Department counterterrorism official. In New York, we have Suzanne Nossel. She is the executive director of PEN America. And in Phoenix, we cross to Patrick Henningsen. He is a journalist, writer, and founder of the news website, 21stCenturyWire.com. All right, folks, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Patrick, if I can go to you first in Phoenix, you got up earliest for this program. What do you make of this um, uh, WikiLeaks uh, release? Because, you know, over the last couple of days, I've been monitoring it in mainstream media, and it's being relatively downplayed, I would say, considering the magnitude of this story here. Uh, the usual, you know, Assange is a traitor, he's a bad guy. They don't want to talk about the content so much. Um, and, they, and what kind of oversight the CIA had to do this? Were they trying to build their own NSA? Why did they let these, let these consumer products have so many vulnerabilities? I guess the obvious answer is because they wanted to be able to spy. I mean, th this is a big deal. Uh, and all they're doing is uh, raising their hands, saying, oh, it's terrible, this leak, but not talking about the leaks themselves. And it looks like they're just beginning. Go ahead, Patrick. Well, I think w one of the big revelations from this is we now know that, you know, we s essentially have two agencies, uh, the NSA and the CIA, and the CIA has constructed a, a, a sort of an NSA-type body. Essentially, they're doing the same thing. The only difference is, you know, one of these theoretically has oversight, uh, maybe the NSA, and one of them doesn't, uh, the CIA. So this is done completely in the shadows. And worse than that, we find out as well the, the level to which uh, the CIA is able to sort of outsource uh, mm -hmm. certain jobs to GCHQ in Britain, for instance. So that sort of gives them deniability. Uh, it doesn't put their fingerprints directly on any operation. But more than that, I say in the current political context, it sort of, uh, it's about time we give credit where credit's due. All the limelight's been on Russia for all their sort of nefarious uh, hacking uh, abilities, theoretically anyway, and uh, right now we can see, you know, who the top hacker in the world is, and the scope of uh, the operation is just unbelievable. And, uh, you know, all nations hack, Russia hacks, China hacks, everybody hacks, intelligence services wouldn't be doing their job if they weren't hacking. However, they're not in the same league uh, as the United States. And we have to not forget the CIA does fall under the purview of the federal yeah. government. I think it's spoken in the media like it's some sort of separate body autonomous onto yeah. itself. It should fall under some kind of oversight well, uh, in a progressive democracy. Well, hopefully that's going to be done. Suzanne, if I can go in, in, to you in New York, what do you make of all this? Because the, the issue of oversight is very important here. Um, it doesn't appear that they are answering to anyone about these uh, programs here, which they certainly should be. And again, I want to stress here is that they knowingly allowed products to go out there that have vulnerabilities. And with this kind of information apparently was being passed around, these secrets, for a little while. Quite a few people had uh, access to it, and now, um, because of leaks, everybody has it right now, and these vulnerabilities can be taken advantage by other people here. Go ahead, Suzanne. Well, I don't know that it's the responsibility of the intelligence agencies to ensure that products to, don't go out into the marketplace with vulnerabilities, and I think a lot of these vulnerabilities were known about some of them. We understand were already patched. You know, they date back years to prior versions of the software behind these devices and platforms. So it's not entirely clear how many of these methods are still in active use. I mean, certainly it's a very potent reminder that we do not enjoy security and privacy on our devices, that uh, the notion that these are the equivalent of, you know, a diary or a lockbox is just false, that passwords offer us secure protection, that's false. And so <clears throat> consumers, uh, Americans, people around the world have had to recalibrate how they think about their devices, their communications, their emails, uh, social media activity, knowing that we don't really know who may be looking over our shoulders or how. I mean, the idea that a television, even when turned off, can be a listening device is something out of a James Bond movie. But I don't think anybody would have imagined that there's a, you know, a particular brand, if you happen to buy the wrong brand, you know, you might be subject to that kind of surveillance. You know, you know, Larry, uh, we all agree here, and I'm sure our viewers do, that you, you do need to have security um, and you need to have these kind of intelligence programs. But the problem here is, and 
Patrick mentioned it a little bit earlier, at least he alluded to it, is that this kind of uh, vulnerabilities in which you can spy on people can be used for political reasons. And we can think of the, the situation with General Flynn, for example, when you, uh, when you have intelligence right. operatives that can get information and, and use it against your political foes. And, you know, and particularly if it's the government using it against American citizens or someone that was, that was going to assume a government position here. And I think that's the real concern here is that you, you can blackmail people, you can threaten them, uh, because you can spy on them so easily. Go ahead, Larry. Well, what we have is a national security infrastructure in the United States that's basically still a 1948 model, has not caught up to the technological changes that have occurred, because the you know, original incarnation of the National Security Agency was back in an era where you were looking at intercepting radio signals and then telephone uh, signals, but those telephones, you were tapping into wires. You were literally wire tapping. It was, it was dependent upon uh, a f uh, something physical that you had to have contact with in order to start listening in on other people. So it was not easy to just uh, go through the, uh, the air and, and penetrate. Now what we have are this, with the advent of wireless and the development of computers and smartphones, that suddenly the ability to have privacy in your own home it has disappeared. The, the, you know, again, the notion was before was that the government had to go get a warrant to physically come into your house to search and to look for, you know, evidence of some crime. Now, they, yeah, they're supposed to get a warrant, yeah, but they, they don't even have to physically break into your house. They can cross over. And so the lack of accountability in the system, and the, it, it, it's so powerful, it does, it's not bound by any kind of geographic border. I mean, remember in the past, some of the big intelligence operations were, you know, when the CIA was climbing into a tunnel in Berlin to literally plug into a cable that was going to the, the Soviet embassy or tapping underwater phone lines that, you know, cables that were laid. We're, we're well past that, and nobody's thought through how do you bring accountability to that system. Well, it, Patrick here, I guess, you know, the concern is here, too, is, I, I, you know, right. government, government spy on governments all the time. I mean, that's the time in memorial here. But I guess the real concern is if there's no oversight here <coughs> in these programs that we're just beginning to learn about, I mean, was there any oversight making sure that they wouldn't be tapping into American citizens and on their devices as well? I mean, you know, the law is the CIA shouldn't be doing that here. Now, if they're doing things that are so opaque, possibly without a mandate, possibly illegal, what, 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 what stops us? To think that they might be doing that to uh, on a global scale, including American citizens. Yeah, we're we're kind of at an epoch right now, technologically, where technology has actually eclipsed uh, the law, uh, as it were. Um, so you know, in terms of like say, you know, asking for a FISA. Uh, court order. You know, you, you actually don't need a FISA court order because the the data, or the, maybe the intelligence, or the information is sitting there uh, on someone's desk, and all you need to do is go and look at it. So, you know, do you need a FISA uh, not to gather, but to go look at something? All the, constitutionally, there's no expectation of any sort of rights. Uh, or privacies, this is a huge problem. I think uh, what Susan alluded to earlier, saying, you know, we don't, we shouldn't expect any security with any of our devices, that may be true, but, you know, what does this say about our society? In, in my view, and others, maybe America, soci American size, in a kind of a dark place at the moment, where, you know, what's most concerning about this leak is the lack of concern. Yeah. You know, students would be, you know, young people would be yeah. the people you'd expect to be out protesting about this because they use their devices, they love their devices, but what are they doing at Middlebury College in Vermont? They're, they're, they're protesting in favor of more censorship on campus. You know, we're at a very strange place, liberty-wise, uh, in, in the American culture right now. That's to me, is the most the most concerning thing well, right well, now. I, well, Susan, uh, Susan, if I can go back to you in New York, I, I, the other thing I think we have to be really worried about is that it, it look, you know, where you have uh, uh, the, direct, the directorate that can, controls this kind of these cyber tools, and this is a, presumably where the leak came from. I mean, so these are the people that are supposed to be guarding the secrets, but that's where the leak, or maybe a contractor related to the directorate, leaked it as well. I mean, it's really interesting. We, we saw what happened to uh, Bradley. Um, are, are these people or individual willing to go through that again? I mean, the, these people are Raisin. Go ahead. Well, uh, I think that's true. We don't know who leaked this. I mean, one thing I do want to come back on is uh, you mentioned General Flynn. I mean, in that case, you know, as you've said, the idea that there is uh, interception 
and wiretapping or the modern equivalent of conversations with foreigners in this country, you know, that's nothing new. So I don't think that particular example really goes to the question of intrusions on to American citizens and their devices. You know, as to the question of leakers, you know, uh, it, it clearly is an ongoing problem that our government has to face. And the measures that they put in place, you know, subsequent to the uh, Chelsea Manning disclosures, subsequent to the uh, Edward Snowden disclosures, clearly have not put a stop to this. You know, we don't know how these methods are being used, whether they're being used in a warrantless way. I mean, these methods that have been disclosed over the past week, from what I understand, are not dragnet surveillance. These are not massive data sets that the government is able to collect and then sift and sort to find uh, keywords, names of suspects and the like, and then uh, trace a trail of contacts to get a list of those who are associated with potentially unsavory or dangerous individuals. This is different. This is These are techniques where if they identify somebody uh, who is a person under suspicion, they have a, a range of sophisticated methods beyond what had been previously okay. uh, realized Susan. in order to okay. uh, tap in and have, invade uh, those, that person's have, communications. But whether that's being I, used I have without to, a warrant, I have, to go, I have to go to a hard break here. After a short break, we'll continue our discussion on WikiLeaks' latest release. Stay with our team. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. To remind you, we're discussing WikiLeaks' latest release. Okay, I'd like to go back to Larry in Washington here. I, I want to go back to the, the Flynn example here because I think it is germane because he was a private citizen. Yes, he was talking to a foreigner, and I can understand why a U.S. intelligence wants to know what uh, uh, foreign diplomats are doing in America. I can, that's perfectly fair. Um, but Flynn was a private citizen, and his involvement in that telephone conversation was leaked, and that is illegal. His rights were violated. Right. And, you know, this is the reason why I'm bringing it up. And, I, and, and Patrick started with here. We have the NSA that has a mandate to do these kinds of things, and there are certain laws and regulations they have to follow. We didn't know about this with the CIA, and so if they don't have the kind of oversight that we don't know about, uh, and it hasn't been released, uh, then the, the rules don't apply to them. And that's why we could, I worry there could be a lot of Flynn's in the future. All right, go ahead, Larry. Well, it's, it's one thing that a conversation of the Russian ambassador was intercepted. You can say that's normal, but I, I think the Russian ambassador knows that that's yeah. a likely possibility. So therefore, the Russian ambassador would never be discussing anything sensitive, classified, or nefarious over a, an unclassified line, number one. Number two, even if it's intercepted by U.S. intelligence, the rules are when you have an American citizen, you don't identify who that American citizen is unless there is evidence of wrongdoing or some possible criminal activity, at which point then there's a process that you go through, what they call minimization, and that to get permission to expose who that American citizen is. That's not what happened in this case. In fact, uh, the New York Times reported that this information was taken to the White House and, quote, briefed to the White House, which means Barack Obama was told about it. Now, Barack Obama is a constitutional scholar, allegedly, so he should have right off the bat said, whoa, stop. You know, what is the probable cause here for allowing you to identify uh, an American citizen other than the fact that, you know, they view him as a political enemy? And that's what's so dangerous about this, is what, what we're seeing is that the CIA does now have the capability to operate domestically, and, and they can use the cover of that they're operating against terrorist target overseas, but it can spill over so easily into the domestic yeah. arena, and that un, without proper oversight can be used against political opponents. You know, Patrick, one of the first things I thought of after, after reading details of the, of the first uh, uh, release of uh, leaks here uh, from WikiLeaks is that, you know, this uh, attribution uh, <coughs> uh, technology they have, they can hack somebody and they can put somebody else's fingerprints on it and then, you know, you create a, a real a dust storm right there. And you know where I'm going with this here. After six months of, you know, Russian hacking of our election when no evidence has been produced Produced whatsoever, even a number of reports have come out that are laughably stupid in their de lack of detail. Okay, and I'm not saying that it's not true. I'm just saying 
Where's the evidence? And now we know that there are tools to create a false flag and blame somebody else. It's out there uh, in these weak, uh, uh, leaked documents. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, well, certainly this, this revelation with Vault 7 sort of changes that conversation when looking at the sort of uh, possibility of a, a Russian hack on the U.S. Uh, elections or the DNC. Uh, with the Umbridge uh, program, which was detailed in this leak, the, the ability to do a false flag hack, basically, and to plant evidence uh, that would sort of implicate somebody who didn't actually do the hack, that's all there detailed uh, in this document. But, you know, more, more than that, it, you know, you talk about being above the law, above oversight. You know, between the NSA, between uh, the CIA, uh, between GCHQ, between any of these other handoff intelligence organizations, you, this is kind of like a syndicate. It's almost like an organized crime syndicate that operates completely on its own, uh, very little oversight. And, you know, in what kind of oversight can you have with something that scale? And then on the commercial side, uh, you have this sort of not reporting vulnerabilities to manufacturers uh, and leaves the consumer vulnerable to all sorts of hacks and the CIA's leaving some of this off the shelf stuff which is intentionally unclassified that's also detailed in the Vault 7 um, that creates this kind of again this protection racket in the commercial sphere with virus protection that isn't actually effective anyway uh, so, you know, who's the loser at the end of the day? It's the consumer or it's the voter or the, uh, the citizen in this, in this case. I think America has to um, accept the reality that we are reaching peak freedom. You've heard of peak oil. Uh, that maybe we should talk about this new term, call it peak freedom, uh, because this is what this sort of technology or this sort of ability by the state indicates, is that we are reaching our sort of uh, apogee in terms of freedom. You know, Suzanne, right as we were sitting down to do this program here, uh, Julian Assange was giving an address, some kind of brief uh, 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 briefing with, uh, um, I don't know if it was with the media, I don't know if it was probably being telecast and, and people were watching it. And just as I was sitting down here, um, my editor told me that MS, uh, MSNBC was carrying it, and then it cut it off after a minute, and they decided to have a panel of people to discuss what Julian Assange well, they weren't listening to what he had to say. They were talking about him here. Do you, think, do you find that troubling here? I mean, irrespective of what you think of Julian Assange, this is a big story here. Shouldn't the, the, the public hear what, why he's doing this and why he thinks is important? Then you can disagree with him instead of just censoring him like that? Go ahead, Suzanne. Well, I'm not aware of the incident that you specified, but my sense is not that he's been censored. He got this information out into the public. WikiLeaks uh, framed it. Uh, they explained what they were trying to do, what they were releasing, well, what they weren't releasing. He was trying um, to tell. He was trying made, to tell the world. He was, so he was trying to tell the world why he was doing this. Don't you think that's worth listening to? You know, but he has many methods to do that. Whether he does that, you know, what networks air it was, that. It was live. It was you know, live. It was live. They, can it make, but I think the story has been, it has, well, I don't, I, I have to say, I didn't see that clip, so I can't address why they cut him off. Uh, I really can't comment on that, but I do think as the story has come out, WikiLeaks has been able to make its position uh, quite clear. You know, when I came into this room, I couldn't hear what Assange was saying, but he was on a, a, yeah. a monitor in this room being broadcast. So my sense is he's getting that story out. Larry, what do you think about that? Because it seems to me, again, we started out the program here, is that the mainstream media is just putting it into a, a certain spectrum. They want to look at a certain angle of it, not, not addressing some of the issues that we've already talked about on this program. Go ahead, Larry. Well, it, 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 you know, this may sound a, a tad extreme, but uh, you know, I remember the days uh, when I was involved at the CIA uh, with what was described as covert action and information operations, where you, you, and when you have a story to tell, you want to get that message out there and help shape that message. And, uh, you know, I witnessed very clearly in which we were able to try to do that overseas. What I've been watching here in the United States is there has been a decided uh, anti-Russian propaganda campaign that is underway both to portray Donald Trump as a stooge of the Russians, a puppet of Putin, uh, as well as to portray Russia as this great and growing threat, a menace that we must now rally around to, to, to defeat and to uh, defend against. And it, it's genuinely frightening 
that unless you have a the the your point of unless your point of view conforms with what's uh, in the in the editorial control of those who direct the both the, the radio, television, and, and newspaper outlets, uh, th there's deliberate efforts to try to silence those voices, and, and so this is uh, you know I think they, they, I there's think sort of almost true. a collective you know. decision to studiously. Okay. Well, I, I, I can you, I can give you example after example of you know here, here's one clear example. Just two weeks ago, we heard in the United States about oh my God, Russia's got a spy ship off the coast, east coast of the United States. I don't recall a single outlet describing the fact that the United States was conducting naval military exercises in the the Black Sea as well as in Romania, as well as in the Baltics, as well as in Poland, with both ground troops and naval forces. Instead, the only, the only one I saw was on Fox News, they showed a Russian plane buzzing a Navy ship, implying that Russia was doing something outrageous, with no comment whatsoever about what was actually going on, what the United States was doing when viewed from a Russian perspective would show it was in fact a provocative action. What, how would the United States react if Russia was conducting military exercises on our borders in Canada, Mexico, and just off our coast, we would be alarmed. And that's the, and the fact that the collective media chose to go that route. To me, I, I don't, I can't imagine that it's just because they're stupid. Okay, Suzanne, you want to re uh, react to that? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't agree. I mean, I think there are a range of perspectives about the role of Russia uh, and its influence on the United States right now. We have a president who uh, wants a very positive relationship with Russia and speaks about that often. We have other commentators in the media who support that. We have people on the left who've come out uh, and said that this idea of a Russian menace is wrong and needs to be countered. So I think we hear a breadth of views. You know, it is true that the kinds of things, some of the kinds of things that the U.S. has done over many years to influence elections in other countries, you know, we don't quite square with the sense of alarm we have when someone does that to us. And I think, you know, that's a point to consider. But I, I think there are very real and serious concerns that have been raised about the role of a foreign power in influencing our election. It's not something we've had to deal with in the past. I think, uh, you know, we treasure our democracy in this country. We view it as sacrosanct. People want to protect it. The idea that it's being influenced from the outside is alarming. We have faith in our institutions. We believe if they're allowed to function, that they will generate the result, a result that is more fair than any okay. other approach. Okay. So I think having let, a, let me, a sense of concern about whether that's being intruded upon is perfectly valid. Let me go to Patrick here. What is very interesting here is that I don't think it's foreign powers that are really threatening the United States. You have people like um, uh, you have Snowden and you have uh, Bradley Manning and now these new leaks here. They're all coming from inside the United States, not foreigners. Go ahead. Last word. Yeah, the, people say the idea that Russia is influencing or uh, subverting U.S. democracy is just an idea. There's no evidence. The biggest subversion in the United States comes from within the United States. If you want to talk about meddling with our democracy, look no further than the DNC themselves. Look no further than whistleblowers. Look no further than leakers. Look no further than the U.S. mainstream media in terms of subverting Patrick, and meddling I, I in have the democratic to, process. I have to jump in here, folks. We've run out of time. Many thanks to my guests uh, in Washington, New York, and in Phoenix. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, Crosstalk Rules.